This is Metrosource Minis, the official podcast of Metrosource Magazine and home of short-form interviews with your favorite personalities from the LGBTQ world and beyond. Quick, fun, and informative, it's Metrosource on the go. Out and proud since 1990. Well, hello, hello, hello. This is Metro Source Minis. I'm your host, Alexander Rodriguez. So during this quarantine, celebrities have been inviting us into their homes, their bedrooms, uh, everywhere to share uh, what, what, they're, what they're doing uh, via digital streams. Our guest today has been giving us free digital concerts and candid chats during COVID. Emmy winner Jay Rodriguez is no stranger to representing our community from his very early days on the then new network, Bravo TV, on the Queer Eye for the Straight Guy. He went on to appear, of course, on Broadway and in the film, in The Producers, Reba McIntyre's Malibu Country for ABC, Lady Gaga's Telephone, uh, and Kingdom with Nick Jonas, but, as well as critically acclaimed guest spots on Nip Talk, Bones and Harry's Law, and hosting gigs for numerous TV projects, including the Dance Mom reunion special. Uh, he has appeared on stages across the country with his solo concerts that feature songs from his theater career, his time in Rent, and stories, and some good juicy stories from his extensive career. We talked with Jay from Metrosource Online, metrosource.com, about his most recent role for HBO Max's docu-series, Equal, which showcases lesser-known LGBTQ heroes from our past. And Jay played uh, the role of activist Jose Saria, a.k.a. the Widow Norton. And to continue our chat today, please welcome... Jay Rodriguez. <laughs> Hi, welcome to my bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> How many times have you said that? <laughs> Honestly, not so often this year. <laughs> not so often. Okay, so Actually, I see that. All. <laughs> right? Oh, God, it's like a desert. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I see the aquarium behind you. That's actually one of your your hobbies that you've been uh, doing. Yeah, during, I actually have six. Corbin. I have six aquariums. This one's the oldest. I got with this one in uh, um, ABC Home and Carpet in New York City. It's like a big furniture store, but they also have a pop art section. So you can see it's an RCA Vision old school TV I love it. that's gutted with an aquarium. And I just my new hobby was making sure all the aquariums were planted with real plants. Um, and uh, and yeah, so that's been keeping me busy. Well, I mean that's a that's a good habit. My habit is drinking vodka and watching uh, reruns of The Bachelorette. <laughs> I do. I, well, I do the vodka thing on my virtual happy on my Facebook every afternoon. But yeah. Oh, I know, girl. I know you were belting out the other day. You were singing uh, that song from The Greatest Showman. You were oh, giving yeah. it all. Oh, um, thanks. Love it. So you and I have talked so many different times in so many different uh, ways. And what I really love talking about you or uh, chatting with you is that you are so candid. There's no smoke and mirrors. You don't pull any punches. Um, and so I want to talk about, you know, we just got through this horrific election and we've seen members of our community, our family, even members of our own LGBT community support someone who clearly does not support equality or even basic human rights. I had to delete people from my social media and even from my own personal life uh, because they were sharing views and statements that were not factual or that were extremely hurtful. Um, and now that we've won the election, it's like, how do we handle those relationships? Uh, what do you think of cancel culture? Is it necessary ever? And now that we're kind of on the right path again, do we uncancel people? Yeah, that's a great question. So for me, I've just always been around opposition. I've never really... <clears throat> I think, it, you know, as I've gotten older, I've had the luxury of living um, in in sort of, you know, bubbles, but my work takes me in spaces where not everyone is co-signing on, on, you know, the what I believe to be true and my experience has proven uh, to be true for me. Um, so I'm so used to it. And I think, you know, when I was working in radio, I think one of the things that I was a, a big compliment that my program director would say to me all the time was that I had a a fairness to where I share the story. I would share my opinion, but then also understand that in this digital age, there's so much miscommunication. And in the past X number of years, you know, news is really relative as to where you get it. And um, for a lot of people, <clears throat> excuse me, I think they've been a little bit misguided and a lot of things that have been presented to them as fact have fueled kind of this bias and 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 to be honest kind of a deep-rooted hatred so for me personally i'm not the biggest proponent of cancel culture unless it's something that's directly impacting my existence for instance let's look at social media um yeah. i've just gotten to that tendency of muting people and some people just blocking if it's hatred um i'm blocking right but if it's i can kind of sniff out that it's just pure ignorance i'm going to put you on mute because i 
want the opportunity to have a conversation with you. And I think the hardest thing is, um, you know, we can't kick people off the planet. Eventually you're going to encounter people that you don't see eye to eye with. And um, I remember growing up, one of the things that, uh, growing up religious in the church, they would always say they will know we are Christians by our love. And while I'm not a practicing, you know, born again Christian now, um, I know that some of the the best conversations that I've ever had were because I was open to hearing what someone had to say. However, we have to draw a line with our own self-care. Um, and that means if you're in a position in in your life or in your space where people are saying things that are really toxic and um, upsetting to you and impacting your day-to-day -day life, by all means, remove that party. Um, and, you know, I always say social media is... Um, it's a it's a privilege to connect with people in that way, but it's not a right. Not everyone should have access to your life or your personal thoughts, nor you know should you really give much attention to what people uh, have to say about your thoughts and your and you know like Mama Ru says, unless that bitch is paying your bills, pay them bitches yep. no mind, you know. And so <laughs> I, that's kind of how I I've led. I've I've, I've struck struck in a balance where I've had you know conversations with folks, but the indoctrination um, uh, is so. Uh, deeply rooted for folks who have gotten misinformed for several years that they're looking at us like we're crazy. And so while we have, you know, President-elect Biden and uh, President, uh, Vice President-elect uh, Kamala Harris uh, going to be in the White House, it is, it, the work is going to get harder because yeah. a lot of truths are going to come to light and we're going to have to have really difficult conversations. Imagine we've been isolated from some of the people um, who maybe didn't post their feelings on social media and we don't know where they stand. Alex, so the, one of the biggest things I'm thinking of is, well, now I have to add a whole slew of things I took for granted before um, as characteristics and traits I'm seeking in a partner. Um, because I, I would be very, I was very, very shocked and surprised to, to hear that, you know, 20% uh, of our community, 28%, uh, which is double what uh, voted for Trump this time around. 2016, I think it was 14%. I think it's 28% this time, uh, according to exiting polls. That was shocking to me and jarring. Yeah. But then when I saw people's um, rationale for it, a lot of it was um, based in um, giving a pass to the same bigotry they give a pass to within our community. And we just haven't been shedding light on those issues within our uh, marginalized community that, um, you know, a lot of the same kind of, well, if it doesn't impact me, it's not my problem mentality yeah. has bled into our community um, longer than it should have. Um, but I'm hoping this time of isolation where we're doing self-reflection that we come out of it um, eager to have empathetic conversations with people, understanding that many people have been misinformed for a long time. Well, I mean, it's it's really a touchy subject and uh, somebody very, very close to me for 15 years, part of the LGBT community did vote for Trump. And two months before the actual election, things were just getting so dicey. We yeah. stopped all communication. I just, I kind of had a meltdown. I'm like, I, I cannot believe yeah. that you're doing this. You know, somebody so close to me, and now that the election uh, hopefully is 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 over, um, ne neither one of us has made that text. And I'm talking about somebody that uh, I was seeing or texting a million times every single wow. day. Wow. Um, and neither one of us has made that first move to like, okay, now now what do we do? And my friend just came out to their to their family, and I and I and I and and they were very surprised, or I guess they were expecting like an instant, we accept you. And I was like, yeah, we also have to understand that there was a journey and a process for you coming to your own self-awareness and, and awakening that this was something you wanted to share. And they are allowed to go through their own journey of acceptance. Um, and so I'm hopeful that over the course of time that the temperature will come down a little bit more and we'll be able to um to have some of the conversations but to be honest alex there's no guarantees i mean yeah. this might be you know people might really double down we don't know what the next four years hold but i know how my where my intentions are and that is to try to lead um you know as per the words of uh joe biden with with empathy and compassion and try my small part which is my community and those around me well now virtually uh to to bring us all together and that's what i do daily on my facebook page um uh, because I had a lot of people in there who were supportive of the president, um, certainly in the spring and summer. And as I just shared my organic stories and, and, and experiences I had and specifics that did not apply to them because they are not part of the community. Um, many of them did switch their votes and were like, to be honest, 
I just always thought he was good for you guys because they said he was. I'm like, who's they? And like, I don't know. I read something that he's like the most pro gay president in history. And I was like, okay, let's unpack that <laughs> step by step. Right. But then you, but you, but I saw their kind of like ignorance to it. And I saw their desire to say, well, I would never intentionally have, now that I'm fueled with this knowledge, I'm going to make a different decision. So Jay, I want to talk to you, you know, you have worked tirelessly, um, especially during this election and COVID and of course throughout your whole career. And just like, like you just said, um, the work is just beginning. Do you ever suffer from what I like to call activist fatigue, where you're just like every interview has to deal with what I have to say about the election or yeah. what I've done for the LGBT community? I mean, that has to be an exhausting. And as a performer, it's like sometimes you just want to talk about your skill or your craft or your voice. Um, or tell me how you deal with it. Yeah. Yeah, and so, so um, tell me how you deal with that fatigue, because a lot of celebrities in the LGBT community are really dealing with that, and it's it's not gonna end. <laughs> yeah, so I, I'll say it's twofold. One, I think self-care is one of the most important things. You have to give from your surplus, not from your deficit. And I think that understanding when you don't have anything to give, you know what, if something monumental happened, it's beautiful in your if, if you're in a space in your life where you wanna put on social media a thoughtful post, but it is not your job or obligation to have to clap back at every troll to have to post at everything that seemingly feels monumental that you can do it in your own time if you'd like to um but i think the comparison to other activists i think kind of tripped me up if i'd see someone you know and their post was longer or give more uh stats or you know more from you know i just stopped comparing myself to others and mm -hmm. understand that i'm waking up every morning trying to do the best i can and to challenge myself to constantly do better but in the same breath holding on to the fact that we're in an epidemic uh that it, a global pandemic at that where it has directly impacted my ability to work, my ability to um, navigate my own anxiety about the future. So with that, I'm actually doing the appropriate amount of self-care and sometimes just unplugging. Sometimes I won't even open uh, social media or post. The days where I, I don't post anything and I've give, allowed myself some grace for that. And, um, you know, I love uh, there, there's all different kinds of activism. Um, and I think that a lot of keyboard warriors may want to say that unless you're posting a million posts a day about a certain cause that you're not being impactful. Well, there's many different ways to be impactful. And I think what I like to be is heard and understood. And I feel like if I can communicate better in my daily live streams, um, than a static post that might get ignored, then I'm going to do it that way. Um, I want to talk about HBO. Um, who knew uh, in my very early uh, childhood, and I'm dating myself, HBO used to play like the same uh, handful of movies over and over and over. And that was it. Like every Saturday, you might get a new movie. Who would have thought that HBO now would be representing the LGBT community in such a big way, such as through Euphoria, Legendary, We're Here. And now, of course, the docu-series that you were a part of, Equal. Um, how did you get involved with Equal? It's really funny because um, HBO Max is like the you know streaming version of HBO, even though HBO is already streaming. This yeah. is sort of their subsect. So I like to call it, it's like their younger little step cousin. It's the hip. Because, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a lot of- HBO you know, hip. <laughs> yeah. And certainly Equal was a, a very ultra low budget project. Um, there's really no budget for this project. And I remember I was auditioning for it and I had worn my, I watched the audition for a show that takes place in 1960 and or my <laughs> scenes and my phone my i watch was blowing up with text messages and i left the audition and it was the queer eye boys and this is in february and they had flown in to shoot family feud so that was a thursday and i said sorry for the delay and i noticed the creator of queer eye was in the group chat not that strange because I, I don't know that he's ever really reached out to us in that way before maybe just once or twice but you know since we wrapped yeah. so i um was like, sorry guys, I missed all this. I was in an audition for an HBO show. He immediately said, which one? And I said, oh, it's for HBO Max. It's called Equal. And he's like, that's my show. And Alex, I've never done this, but I literally was like, so why don't we just cut through all the red tape here and you can just offer me the role. But I knew I went in, <laughs> I I knew I went in for something that I wouldn't be right for. I went in for a, a storyline from the Mattachine Society in the New York version, playing someone iconic who was white and I looked him up and I looked nothing like him. So I wasn't sure if I would you know, be right for this role, but I knew they were reading everyone for the same handful. And by the way, this audition, for some odd reason, everyone got the same call time. It was gay Hollywood. Uh, yeah. All, every gay celebrity that was there was all out, uh, you know, actors. Um, and 
It was kind of, we took pictures. We felt like it was gay prom, um, but that's kind of how I got it. Like he was like, oh my God, ha ha ha. Let me connect you with my producing partner who also produced Queer Eye. These are uh, the producer of the show also produced Queer Eye. And so um, I didn't hear anything for like two weeks. And then they said, listen, there's this role in the San Francisco story of this activist that we think you're right for. And I got it. And I was like, oh my God, there's so much crossover between Jose Sadia's journey and my journey. And I was like, this makes total sense. And so it fit like a glove. And I think one of the things that scared me most was uh, Jose Sadia's legacy with the Imperial Court, which is a, a large fundraising organization that you know he established decades ago and is still in existence over 70 chapters in the US um, and Italy and Canada. And you know his legacy runs deep and people you know who are still with us knew him very well. And I was like, there's gonna be such comparisons and you know, am I gonna be able to do this? And so I just delved right into the research and just found every single YouTube audio file and visual file I could. He's a specific tone to his voice and cadence and the way um, that he speaks. And, um, and even with the hair and makeup, you know, drag um, was the vehicle of art that Jose used uh, to be a storyteller and an activist in the nightclubs. And um, it was different back then. And so I, I, I had to just like let go of all my preconceived notions of what drag should look like. And, and I loved what the makeup artist did because we, we literally mirrored um, a photo uh, almost exactly. And to my great and humble surprise, the Imperial Court, um, now led by um, uh, Mother Empress Nicole um, of Ramirez, uh, are actually awarding me the Jose Sadia Award this Saturday. I saw that. I saw yeah, that. That's that was, amazing. That was like the gag of gags. What an so, honor. So it was a huge honor because they only gave it to one other actor. It's usually reserved for politicians or activists. And um, and I've always said my career has been this um, this this kind of, I've had a sort of a chameleon career. I've never stayed in one lane and that's just out of necessity, but um, rarely have I had moments of, you know, being celebrated as an individual and not just a part of a cast. And um, it was humbling, but also just, I just feel like their mission and the work they do is so in alignment with who I am that it was, uh, yeah, it's just, you know, these moments don't come up too often and, and I'm, I'm humbled, you know? Uh, well, I have to tell you, you being cast as Jose, um, I, I had heard the name The Widow Norton, but I, I, I'm going to be honest, I really did not know his story. And so being part of the Latin culture, I really wanted to know who we were portraying and, and what was going on. So to find out that he was the first openly gay candidate to run for office uh, and any political office in the U.S. He also formed one of the first biz, uh, gay business associations. And like you said, he founded the Imperial Court. I loved uh, some of the uh, behind behind the stories, such as he lied to get into the military because he wanted to serve in the military so yeah. badly. He was super short, um, of course gay. He kind of seduced one of the uh, recruiting officers into letting him in, and he served um, our, our country. That's um, right. And, and I just... Yeah. And I, I just love that that kind of passion and vim and vigor that we have a, as a Latin culture. What aspect of his life um, really uh, affected you the most? The, um, the fearless bold nature of his activism, even in selecting um, his name. Um, Jose Sadia also, you know, in the in the era of all these drag queens, and then suddenly there were empresses in San Francisco, and he didn't want to be just another empress. So in his own words, as the story goes, and there's a bunch of videos on YouTube where he's retelling the story. Um, and by the way, I am using he pronouns because all his friends and, and, and he uh, himself use he pronouns. So, um, he said that he didn't want to be another, um, just another empress and uh, took the bold and brazen step to um, link himself to this old eccentric from the 1800s who had like, you know, been a famous kind of eccentric personality who had passed away, you know, obviously way before Jose was born and started going by this person's, uh, as this person's widow. Edward Norton was this eccentric, printed his own money, he was a kook. And so to got it, you know, be a step above the other empresses, she created, she she said she was the widow Norton. So much so that she went to um, where he's buried, which is in a public park, but it's kind of like private. You can't just be, you know, going up in yeah. there and like throwing a party. And she went there to lay flowers on his grave and they like stopped her. <laughs> and she's like in like a limo and like black with a veil and flowers like, who are you? And without missing a beat, she was like, well, I'm the widow Norton. And it's not, it wasn't <laughs> impossible, you know? And they were so tickled and moved because they were like, no one's ever visited this guy before. 
that they welcomed her back. And then the next year they'd had bagels. And then the next year there was like a bigger <laughs> spread and she'd bring more people. And then she started making it this, a part of um, their activism and, and fundraisers and such. And I just think like, even if you listen to the audio of when she's speaking at the bar and, and Jose will call out the gays at the time who were stealth and in the closet. And granted, you know, at this era, you could be fired from your job. Um, it was illegal to dress in drag. You needed to have two garments of men's clothing on at all times because it was considered um, not impersonation, but you were basically trying to fool people um, that you were a female. So he kind of found a way around that by giving the drag queens a sign if the police ever raided uh, that said, I'm a boy. This way they had no grounds to arrest them. Yeah. And uh, I just thought that was great. But in terms of the activism, like called out members of the community who were, you know, perhaps voting in the in, in not in the best interest of the community or not coming out, not standing up for what they believed in, but still want to go out. And I don't want to say what she said because it's, you know, it's sex, <laughs> sex talk, but they'll be doing their things at night, you know, and then during the day, putting on the suit and pretending they were yep. just one, you know, another straight guy. And um, and she would call it out. Um, but one of the most beautiful things, too, and I wish I would have done this at some point in my career, but um, she closed every single night um, of her set, her cabaret shows, um, which were very frequent with God Save Us, Nellie Queen. She had rewritten the the, the lyrics to a popular um, you know, national anthem that we have here. And uh and, and when you hear people who are still with us, who got to experience time with her during that era, they're moved to tears when they think about it because at any moment the police could come in and they would just hold each other's hands yeah. and put their arms around each other and sing God Save Us Nellie Queens led by Jose. And I, it, it's just like we take so much for granted. And one of the things as I get older um, that I'm struck by is how we discard older people in the community. Um, and there's such a focus on youth. And I guess that's with every community. But I feel like now more than ever, we need to lean into our elders who really paved the way for us to have so many of the liberties that we have and we take for granted today. You know, the, the gay movement started long before RuPaul's Drag Race hit the airways. And this generation may not be fully aware of that. Um, I, I'm so glad you said that. You know, I volunteer with uh, Project Angel Food, and I, I know that you do, as well as uh, St. Vincent Meals on Wheels in Los Angeles. And the rates of uh, the older generation being left on their own devices is increasing because it used to be cultural. In the Latin culture, we would have to always take care of the parents. That's why you would always see the grandparents in tow. In the Asian culture, that was also just what you did. And, um, you know, with the LGBT culture, it's people that might not have kids. And the young generation is just not doing uh, their work. They're not taking care of the older generation. And so there is a huge need. And so I'm, I'm very glad that you mentioned that because we, we do need to reach out. We need to do our, our part and we need to take care of um, the elders of and our by the society. Way, you don't need to have any money to be a nice yeah. person to an old person, older person at a bar. You don't have to have a lot of money or time in your schedule to deliver meals, uh, to be kind to that older queer person that you cross paths with. But there's this underlying like, oh, that old guy hit on me or like, yeah. I don't want them. You know, there's this whole weird thing that um, that you hear murmur out. And I'm, and I'm thankful and grateful that there is a really intelligent um, young generation who's coming up with access to more information than maybe you or I had uh, about our history um, and, and certainly uh, revering those who didn't have as easy of a go of it as we've had. Okay, Jay, um, are, you, are you ready to play a, a little rapid fire? Yeah. Okay, you have been called in to give the queer eye once over to President-elect Joe Biden. What part of him are you gonna make over first? Oh God, I'm gonna give him comfortable shoes because um, <laughs> I just feel like the poor man, like, you know, they're always coming after him for being sleepy Joe. And, and he, he has to run out song. now. Yeah, when he gave his acceptance <laughs> yeah. speech, you know, he did that little jog and I was like, yep. you know, we need to get him some easy spirits. Looks like a pop <laughs> feels like a speaker. <laughs> okay, uh, the worst, strangest Christmas gift you've ever received. Oh God, the worst and strangest would, um, oh God, that's a really good question. Um, I'm probably gonna think of something um, better after we end this call, but I think <laughs> the strangest one was like a dental kit. Like it was oh. like, like a, a, a weird toothbrush, but not like a battery operated one and like floss and um, like Lister. I thought it was such a bizarre gift. I was like, thank, like, is, thank this, you. is there something wrong? <laughs> Okay, what sitcom from the past would you cast yourself in, male or female role? Oh, uh, easy, Golden Girls. I would definitely be Sophia. 
Okay. Uh, and what would the name of your biography be if you were to write it right now? Oh, I you know, I've had some work working titles that I always kind of lean into, which was uh, Tales from an Aging Twink or um, <laughs> Straight Out of Queer Eye with the Straight Out of Compton logo. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and your favorite backstage memory from doing Rent? Oh, God. Oh, there's so many good ones. Um, probably like there's a, I'm going to name a couple and they're all around the celebrities who would come into the show. Um, Mel B when she would um, leave the stage after doing another day. So you have out tonight. Then you have another day where Roger pushes back and we're like, no other, no other, no day, but today. Right. And she would come back and the days that she didn't feel she did very well. She's like, Oh, I sound like, I sound like bleep. I sound like, and I was like, and then I, there I am about to go on for Will I with my pickle drum and my angel outfit on. And I'm like, it's scary spice. What am I going to say? Like she was fine, you know? And then another one that's really funny and I'm fine dragging him because I think it's hilarious, but Joey Fatone during another day, um, we'd be up on the loft, uh, me and the Mar Collins and some of the life support group people. And Joey Fatone, um, per the blocking, would I'd be up against the railing and he would stand behind me. And Joey would take two fingers <laughs> and literally try to shove them so far up my butt <laughs> while we were singing. And I was like, just trying to elbow him um yeah I, I mean those are, i mean but i have i i my wig fell off i mean we we did um we were doing i'll cover you and there's a dance break in the middle of it just a simple one where you like you know pull each other back and you go under yeah. and his arm just hit like this and that wig went on the floor and i have a wig cap on so it's pretty tight so i didn't know until he was like <gasps> and then look and then one of the home one of the characters who plays a a, a homeless person grabs the wig in there and I was like, oh, you can keep it, honey. And I took off the wig cap and shook my uh, hair. And, that's, you know, it's just- That's yeah. a good recover. That, that, yeah. That's a good recover. Uh, tell tell everyone where you want them to find you and follow yeah. you. Yeah, so I'm just at J-A-I Rodriguez uh, on social media. It's the one with the blue check mark. And every day around 4.30 p.m. Pacific time, I go live um, on my Facebook. It's the one with the blue check mark. And it's this great global community um, that we've just found each other. And it's people from all over the world. And on Mondays, I do Musical Mondays. So you, the audience, get to pick what I get, what I sing, um, which is really, really fun. But come it is stop so by. Fun. Have a drink with me sometime, and um, and yeah, it's just it's been a it's been a, a really interesting quarantine experience. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. This has been our chat with Jay Rodriguez. You can read our in depth interview at metrosource.com. And that's our episode. I'm your host and lead writer for Metrosource, Alexander Rodriguez. You can follow me on Instagram at Alexander is on air. And until next time, stay true and do you. Bye. Bye. That has been another Metrosource Mini. Like, share, and subscribe on your favorite podcast player and check out the latest issue of Metrosource Magazine on newsstands or online at metrosource.com. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram at Metrosource, and on Twitter at Metrosource Mag. Until next time, stay fabulous.